First of all, everyone, good night and welcome back. Tonight, I have a lovely, fabulous person. I'll tell you her nickname after she introduces herself, at least my nickname for her. But please introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. So I'm Polly, um, Polly Hyams. Um, what do you want me to say about myself, Ninoska? Well, don't worry. I'll ask you lots of questions, but I call you Polly Pocket because it was, it was just, you know, you're the, one of the only Pollys I know. And my, my kids were obsessed with like, um, you know, my daughters that when we first met with the Polly Pockets dolls, they were like everywhere all over my house. And I was like, Polly, and then you're just like such a warm, loving individual that I, I, I said one day, I want to just take you and put you in my pocket and carry you along with me. You know, like how people have the, um, you know, in the movies, you have the, the bad angel and the, the good angel type of thing. Everyone should have a Polly pocket, a Polly mm -hmm. in their pocket, who's just like, hi, how are you? Oh, everything's fine. And it's all good. And, and, and just your your funny sense of humor so for me you're Polly Pocket but um you are an amazing qualified um, um midwife and now you have transitioned into this amazing um career as a as a school administrator we'll get into all of that later on because I, I want to find out exactly how you made that fantastic transition but we'll we'll back up a little and I want to ask you where were you born and where did you grow up so I was born in a city called Bristol in the United Kingdom in 1966 oh I didn't ask for the date but look at you <laughs> the year of the world cup England was playing in the final, so what better time to be born? Uh, not that I'm a football freak, but uh, I'm certainly very competitive, so that must have had something to do with it. <laughs> well, you're so I mean, English. It's... You guys are so like connected <laughs> to your like the year that we won the year. You know, like every English person, like you said, regardless of whether you're a big football fan, Scott, uh, soccer for. Um, those in the U.S., um, you guys are very much like you've got your teams and yeah, very invested in it. Totally. So, so you were born there, and then how? When did you make Aliyah? Because you did you get your Ooh. as I as I mentioned, you're a midwife. So did you st you studied midwifery in England? Very good. I studied midwifery, not midwifery. Yep, midwifery. Um, <laughs> <taught me well. laughs> I left home and came to Israel uh, for a year when I was 18. Um, and I, I think about two weeks into that year, I said, okay, that's it. I'm making Aliyah. I don't want to go home. I want to stay. But I already had my place at nursing school. So I, I decided yeah. with... Uh, a heavy heart, but listening to my very wise parents to come home. And I carried on in England. I studied to be a nurse. I studied to be a midwife. I quickly climbed the ranks and went into nurse management, but still working and practicing as a midwife. And I didn't actually make Aliyah for another um, nine years. Mm -hmm. So in, uh, it was 1993. Uh, I was just 27, and that's when I made Aliyah all by myself. Wow. Very brave, first of all. But, um, um, you know, Kolokova to your parents for encouraging you to, you know, I'm now I'm sure that you do appreciate the fact that they were like, finish your education here first, because I'm sure that, that um, especially back then, were you able to to roll over your degrees or were there like steps? Like I know now it's a little bit different, but back, you know, in 93, was it yeah. a little easier yeah. for you? So I was very lucky. Um, I made Aliyah to Ulpan Etzion in uh, Yerushalayim. I think, it, you know, I was single. I had met one other girl who was making Aliyah the same time as me. Uh, we lived together in separate rooms, but we were in um, still in the same dorms. Mm -hmm. And living in Upanetzion was very, very successful. It taught me a little bit about Israeli culture. It taught me how to write a CV. They helped me and pushed me to send all my papers off. And literally within, I think, six weeks of sending all my licenses off to the Ministry of Health, I was produced with, they just gave me my nursing license wow. and 
a temporary midwifery license. So I had yeah. everything that I needed. Um, but six months after I made Aliyah, they changed the laws completely. It was this the same time as the big Russian Aliyah and there was forging of certificates. Um, yeah. And so they changed everything. So yeah. yes, by the skin of my teeth, I was saved because I think if I had to do what some of the young men and women are doing now, which is basically almost rewriting yeah. all of their studies and exams, I don't, I mean, I probably would have done it because I was passionate, yeah. but I, it wouldn't be as, as easy as it was for me, that's for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. So you, you, you got under the wire there. Um, but I look, I understand why it is that they that they do what they do. Um, and the policies that are that are in place. And, you know, and you, you got lucky. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> good for Very. you. In that I mean, and you're looking back on it now. I mean, you're probably like, Oh, dear, I'm so tired now. I can't imagine doing that. But as you said, <laughs> you were young and idealistic and fresh off the boat. And I believe you would have you would have done it anyway. So I think so. And so then you ended up working here. And um, you were in Tel Aviv. You met your husband. Where did you guys meet? How did you meet? I know there's an interesting story there. That's quite a story. <laughs> I have all sorts of stories with Oscar. Um, so Mark is, um, as you know, uh, for everybody else out there, it, my husband is from New York. Uh, Mark is 10 years older than me. Um, and I was working as a midwife in B'nai Brak. I was a senior midwife in Maine Yeshua. Um, and I was, 28 and a half plus minus and single. Oya Broch, a <laughs> single Jewish woman. In B'nai Brach. Not, you know, not, doesn't fit right. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, one of the midwives, um, Mindy Ibrahimov, very dear friend, said, have I got the boy for you? Um, are you interested in a blind date? I was like, yeah. um, I, I wasn't interested even in dating, let alone thinking about marriage. I was having a lovely time being single, living in Tel Aviv, but we exchanged telephone numbers and Mark and I spent probably three to almost four weeks speaking on the phone, speaking and just telling each other everything wow. about each other. Now, in today's world of, of Zoom and Corona and social distancing, it would have been perfect yeah. because we got to know each other so well just by those telephone calls. But my parents came to stay in the middle. I didn't tell them anything about him. I went to a friend's wedding, the same friend I made Aliyah with. He got married. He didn't come with me. It, it was like a whole different part of my life. But uh, every week at work, no, how's it going? Anything mm -hmm. happening? And the story is that I was told that Mark was 34, much taller than me, a history professor and slightly balding. So when Mark met me at my apartment in Tel Aviv for our very first date, our blind date, and I opened the door and there was a man completely bald, um, about my height, he wasn't 34, I learned afterwards he was actually 39. Wow. And he wasn't a history professor, but he was in charge of, or had built the academic research information database in Tel Aviv University. I was like, I know him so well, it doesn't matter that I've been given the wrong information. Exactly. I, you know, it, we were mature enough to have made up our own minds that we wanted to go further. Cut a long story short, Five weeks later, we were engaged. Wow. Five months later, we were married. Wow. <laughs> it's so beautiful. It's a very lovely story. It really is because yeah. I love the fact that you guys Thank spoke you. for so long and got to know one another. And that's like key, you know, that's, um, it's not, I guess people are experiencing it now because of Zoom and Corona, um, their social dating and, um, that definitely, I think, is will lead to, I, I think, stronger and, and better relationships because you get to know the person beforehand and you're not so like quick to jump into things and also quick to judge. Right. Uh, 
you know, so that that's a that's amazing and it's beautiful. So I love. I that. think it teaches people to listen, and I think that's uh, really important because there's not much more that's important in a in a relationship than obviously there's compromise and love and respect. But if you can talk and be listened to, and you can be both the the storyteller and also the listener, you're on a win win. Wow. Amazing, very, very wise words. Um, now you have two beautiful boys in your family. And uh, I don't know if anyone noticed, but we also saw the dog peeking his head around the corner, which was really adorable. <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt you because you were speaking so nicely. But um, first of all, what's the dog's name? I'm a big dog. <laughs> so our dog is called Rolex. Rolex, nice. Because he's a watchdog. <laughs> very cute. Adorable, yeah. adorable. He's a golden retriever and he is my third child. Right. Uh, most definitely he gets treated as his third child. Right. Um, he follows uh, closely in suit after two gorgeous boys as well. Wow, beautiful. Um, and I also, I found something very special about your family. I mean, I, I, Polly and I met through performing together in Women in Theater. And I, I have this great photo of us and I normally don't post photos of me and people, but I have to put this in. It's still one of my favorites. We were just like hugging and it was just a beautiful moment. So I'm gonna like put that inside here. You will pop up um, Good. when I edit. But um, you have a beautiful story in that you have um, one of your sons is adopted. And I always love that when people adopt, you know, it's, it's just beautiful because there's so many children out there who uh, do not have homes yeah. and are still searching for homes. And um, forgive me that I don't remember, I remember that you adopted him fairly young, um, but I can't remember if he was like a baby or, or more of a toddler age. So first of all, we have Arie who's 24. Yes. Um, and Arie is our biological child. Um, and then, we adopted New York when he was two and a half. It was two years and five months. In fact, on the 8th of January, it will be his adoption anniversary. Oh, Ms. Alto. Yeah. Ms. Alto. yeah, it will be, uh, wow, 17 years since we adopted Leo. Gosh, feels like I, it feels like yesterday. Wow, amazing, amazing. Well, I, I love that. It's a beautiful family and a beautiful story. And, um, you know, it's, it's a great, good thing, uh, you know, to be able to give a, a child that needs a home a home. Now, you also have the privilege of bringing so many wonderful children into the world. <laughs> And so not only did you give him a home, but your day to day job used to be day in, day out, just welcoming these beautiful souls into the world. Mm -hmm. um, I never had the pleasure of, of, you know, having you at a birth of mine, but um, I know that people who have spoken um, of, about you and, you know, I, I, you're still like invited to like the simchas and the this and the that. And I mean, it's a special moment. Your, your midwife at, you know, the special bond, the people who are there when you deliver, but everyone just speaks so beautifully and kindly about, about you and what you were doing there. Now, why did you, I mean, how many years did you do it? And, and where were you at here? Okay. In the Okay, so um, I'm just trying to work it out. Actually, I, I stopped midwifery just over four years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so I was actually a midwife for uh, um, close to 30 years. Wow. It's a long time. Yeah. Um, I never stopped loving it. Mm -hmm. And I think um, had there not been a combination of the financial um, crisis in Hadassah mm -hmm. and our own crisis with Lior, um, who really does have um, ever evolving special needs and his desperate need to have me more available, mm -hmm. um, I, I would probably still be a midwife. I mean, do I miss it? Absolutely. I, um, I, I miss the intimacy, the, the privilege. Um, it's a real schut to be able to deliver uh, to somebody's baby. Yeah. Um, 
but at the same token, I think I was also ready for some something to evolve out of myself. Um, I I always saw a different side of, of being a midwife. I was passionate about caring for women who had been traumatized by sexual assault, um, women who had fears and phobias of giving birth, wow. women who had been traumatized by difficult birth. So not only was I in, in very much involved in the deeply intimate, amazing, wonderful, natural process of pregnancy and birth, but I also felt that I had a role to empower women why in England I was working with young teenagers who teenage girls who were pregnant walking them through the whole steps of the pregnancy and the birth wow. so a lot of my job or my profession has also been about um a form of therapy yeah a form of um of um rehabilitation mm -hmm. um and not just the act of delivering a baby and I, I think that's where I evolved into what I do now, yeah. uh, without a doubt. Though it, yeah. it, 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 for me, it's a very natural uh, step forward. Mm -hmm. For a lot of other people, people watching my life or having been observers or having been so involved in my life as a midwife, I think for a lot of people, it was, it was a strange step mm -hmm. uh, until they realize what I actually do. And then it's like, ah, oh, right. Now it makes sense. They can yeah. see the connection. Yeah. Well, well, one thing before we move on to the next, um, one thing is that here in Israel, you said delivering the babies, as is the case in England, the midwives here in the hospitals actually deliver the babies as opposed to the physician. A physician gets called in if there's an issue or complications. Is that correct? Right. So, the midwife has complete autonomy um wow. you know i think in england perhaps even more so mm -hmm. i was delivering babies in pools and in birthing centers and at home it was part of the normal midwife's job was also to get called out in the night and take her bag and off she went call the doctor uh, and tell him that she was going off to deliver a baby mm -hmm. and continue to visit the woman at home and help her with breastfeeding and sit and maybe uh, feed one child, you know, their lunch while, while mom's sitting there crying and trying to get baby latched on. And, you know, it, it was a very holistic approach yeah. in England. Less so in Israel, but definitely autonomous. Midwives um, deliver, I would say 80% of babies are, are delivered by midwives. The doctors are on call and available and on site for complications. They are ultimately responsible, but yeah. um, it's a very serious profession, which is why yeah. it takes another year and a half of training. Yeah. And yeah. you know, you're not you, in in Israel. You don't get your midwifery license immediately. You have a temporary license for a year, and only when you've completed that year of practical. Uh, hands-on delivering of babies and caring for pregnant and um, laboring women then do you get reassessed and then you get your permanent license and I think that in itself goes to show how serious a profession it really is mm -hmm. not to be taken lightly no absolutely absolutely and um it's I, I think I mean I unless it's changed immensely in the last 15 years. But um, in the States, you know, the midwives, you have birthing centers, you would go to birthing centers. And I think some hospitals are now allowing midwives mm. to, to, yeah. to do a little bit more, have a, um, use the facility, the hospital facility, whatever. But um, it's very special here. And uh, I think it speaks to the recovery that women have here and the experience experience that they have also um I agree in terms of their births here so it's it's a beautiful thing it really is a wonderful thing so and I couldn't think of a warmer person a special person like bringing people in like you say you just have a very you have like a very giving soul and you're very like empathic and um you know you always are able to um 
you know, again, pick up on the, the little nuances of what's going on with the person and, and really get to the, to the, the heart of, of what they need, what each individual soul needs, each individual person. So <clears throat> I know that you, did you, did you do um, also, was it uh, maybe um, you did a lot more, um, it, were you more of an administrator towards the end of your tenure there at, um, or team leader or something like that at Hadassah? So or just like yes. a senior midwife? It, I was more, it was considered a senior midwife. I worked also, we, we set up a, a wonderful natural birthing center. Yeah. Um, I worked um, a lot in the natural birthing center. Um, I also was a clinical instructor. So I was responsible for tutoring uh, young new midwives mm -hmm. uh, that were coming in and, and um, helping set them on their way as well as well as also working with student nurses who were coming to do their placement. Um, and when they had their stint on the labor ward um, as part of their gynecological uh, women's health placement, then I would work with them and, and teach them as well. So towards the end, I very much became a, a, an educator as well as yeah. becoming yeah. a practicing midwife. Yeah, so that that ties in and leads in to what your your next um, you know yes. uh, hat, your next role. <laughs> Tell us please about that, how that transitions. Right. We so you want to explain why you you felt you needed to make a change, partly for your family uh, lifestyle. And so, where are you today, and what do you do? Okay, so right now I'm dean of student life at Alexander Mass High School in Israel, which is located in Hodeshara, which is uh, about uh, 20 kilometers north of Tel Aviv, uh, between Tel Aviv and Ranana. Okay. Um, and we are a boarding school mm -hmm. for semester programs for students coming from all over America. Um, we are jointly run by ourselves and JNF. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of um, support, financial support from JNF in America, uh, which is great because they help with recruitment and fundraising to keep the school afloat. The, the school's actually been around since 1976. Wow. So it's an old establishment. Um, but I didn't start as the Dean of Students. Um, when I left Hadassah, I actually took 14 months off to be with Lior. Um, he was very troubled, needed um, so um, I was at home with Leo. Um, he did need a lot of support. So I really took a lot of time uh, to be with him. But sort of 13 months into my 14 month stint, I got a call from the school. Um, a woman uh, called me. Hi, I'm Ayala. I'm head of HR. Um, I saw lots of information about you. You came with a lot of recommendations and we would love you to come and talk to us about uh, renovating and reestablishing our clinic as a nurse. Um, at the time, I had also just finished a two year course on group facilitation and becoming a, uh, an educator for teenagers um, with issues to do with sex and sexuality. Mm -hmm. Um, so it kind of like fitted in. I thought to myself, well, this is great. Yeah. It's teenagers, yeah. it's nursing, yeah. it's six hours a day, uh, mornings only, no Shabbatot, no night shifts. Wow, what could a girl ask for? You know, it was perfect. Um, so I went for the interview and I took that job um, and I loved it. And within a month, I had ripped everything out of the clinic. I'd renovated it, rewritten protocols, yeah. uh, was teaching the madrachim um, to uh, how to relate to teenagers. We were talking a lot more about the changing teenager mm -hmm. in America, which is a lot more promiscuous, a lot more talking about yeah. social media. Um, and... Four months later, the Dean of Students got up one day, had an argument, walked out and left a job. And suddenly this school with anything up to 300, 350 students didn't have a Dean of Students. Wow. And now the Dean of Students job is 
um, very much across between a guidance counselor, social worker, therapist, extra mummy, um, carer, and that position was, was vacant. So very quickly I said, because I'm not one to not take a challenge. <laughs> um, I said, you know, I'll help out. I'll read the, the letters that come from the therapists. I'll, I'll see if there's kids that maybe we shouldn't be taking or I'll work a bit closer with the Dean of Education and the Dean of General Studies and the head of school. And as you can imagine, yeah. the, the, the Rolling Stone, um, it kind of snowballed. And I think that was in the, the end of January. And by the beginning of March, they'd offered me the job as Dean of wow. Students. I believe that. Anyone that <laughs> knows you, that knows Polly, um, because first of all, when you were describing the position for the clinic, you know, I'm like, check, that's Polly, check. Uh -huh, they need this, it needs this, this. Okay, Polly, 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 Polly. And then you moved on to, well, what the Dean of Students actually does for job description. And I'm like, oh, check, 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 check. Yeah, that makes like perfect sense <laughs> to me. So here you are. <laughs> so within a very short span of time, you went from one position in this organization to another, which I'm sure they're very lucky. I know they're very lucky to have you. And um, and so tell to so now all of a sudden you have a whole new job description. Yeah, a whole new job description and a whole new load more hours. I'd gone from this. Six hours. Job. It was six hours and I was home and, and, and it was wonderful. I had time for me and time for the family to sometimes working 12 to 14 hours a day, um, working with other members of staff who had created this crisis because they also didn't know how to make a limit. And the work-life balance, I would say for the first year or so was very difficult so in turn they ended up with some more family crises as a result of that but but I was again very satisfied professionally yeah. um I would say now work-life balance is great you know it, it's taken a few years to uh, to sort of find that that special place where you can work and manage home and feel contented in both of those camps um but the job itself is just wonderful um i have can communication you just, you just of repeat, potential starting students from, parents of actual students um i have from the job itself from where you were saying from the job itself and then i heard you but it was like work, 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 work. So. Oh, so i have um lots of different feathers in my cap. Um, I have connections and communications with potential students and their families. Um, obviously a lot of time to talk with um, parents or students that are on our program presently. Yeah. Um, I train up the, the Madrachim on how to relate to teenagers. Uh, I work very closely with my two fellow deans um, both women were a very formidable, powerful team. Nice. Um, we work very closely on admissions and applications um, of potential students. You know, it's, it's, it's very, very holistic. A student has to fit in academically, emotionally, and socially. Yeah. And all of this when they're thousands and thousands of miles away from home. Yeah, can you imagine? So it's very important to have the emotional social side very well looked after. And that's basically what I do. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of also um, professional development and training, um, working also with our teachers on campus, um, rewriting the code of conduct. That's a huge job. Teenagers are changing, and these are American teenagers, so yeah. Yeah. it's a whole different culture. Building a culture for the school, you know, it's uh, ever evolving. Now, I think that's what I love, is that it's, if I could say that there are some similarities to being a midwife, yes, there are. The caring, the nurturing, the seeing a process through from the beginning to the end, um, it's not, 
nine months, but it's four months if they're here for a semester. But also the constant change. When you deliver babies, you care for a woman, you deliver the baby, mm -hmm. you take her to the postnatal unit, you say goodbye to her, you get another lady in and then another lady in. So here, the change is less rapid, but there's constant variation. And I think that I love. And that together with this idea that I'm helping somebody get from point A to point B safely mm -hmm. and giving them tools and coping mechanisms on the way isn't too dissimilar to, to being a midwife. Yeah, I could see so that. So for me, it's, yeah. it's a win-win situation, really. Yeah, well, you, you answered one of the questions that I always ask people is like, you know, what skill um, set did you bring from your previous position into your current one? But that answers it right there very beautifully. Now, I just wanna ask a question because I don't know a lot about your school itself. I can only imagine that as a teenager, it would be so exciting to do a semester abroad in, in a school in Israel. So um, first of all, um, you said there's the whole application process and everything like that. Is there, is there a specific focus at the school? Is it something, is it an arts? Is it a general studies uh, high school? Um, why, why would it, I don't know, right. besides right. the fun and novelty of going and doing a semester abroad, why, why are students coming mm -hmm. to your school? I think um, teenagers grow, growing up now in America it, and going off to college, it's very competitive. Mm -hmm. So first of all, um, any study abroad program for a semester mm. is an extra feather. It's an extra point in their CV. It looks good. Um, so from that point of view, it, you know, it ticks that box, certainly. But then there are many programs that can fill that spot of being um, a semester abroad program. AMHSI, or Alexander Mass High School, is, an, is a non-political, pluralistic school. So it attracts young um, Jewish teenagers from all over America um, who don't fit into the yeshiva or the seminary uh, track. Mm -hmm. um, it fits in with any type of, almost any type of general studies mm -hmm. so that our students are coming with the classes that they would be carrying on with if they were at home. And at the same time, they have a very, very rich Israel studies um, and Jewish history program that runs concurrently side by side with the general studies. So they're learning about um, history. They're learning about culture. They basically follow Jewish history from 5,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago until today. Wow. Okay. It equips them with knowledge and an ability to, so that, to they stand up as a young Jewish teenager equipped mm -hmm. with all the tools and the knowledge to be able to stand up for themselves in any scenario, whether it be BDS, um, anti-Semitism on campus, mm -hmm. um, to go back into their communities mm -hmm. and, you know, enlighten and empower other young Jewish people to choose this option. Wow, but that's amazing. You know, they're, they're able to, they learn from their Majachim to lead activities. Mm -hmm. they, they have what we call mass magic. That's mm -hmm. what we call it. And they take that magic home with them. And they become Zionists and they formulate their own opinions about the country. Mm -hmm. They may not be necessarily the, the opinion that I might subscribe to, but I'm far happier that they're actually developing the knowledge and an opinion. Yeah. At the same token, they learn to live in dorms with other people, stand on their own two feet, self-advocate, recognize the need to build communities. And I think that's the hugest thing. Young people these days, and even more with Corona, are so insular. 
we, we've become an insular society because we're all at home, we're all on Zoom. And here they have this right now, this blessing of being able to live together, mm -hmm. uh, study in person, respect each other, mm -hmm. build a community and learn everything that is involved in, in, in being part of a community, having a function, being kind, showing empathy and compassion, uh, being able to make the right judgments. Wow. Um, and a lot of parents say, you know, where's my child? What have you done with my child? This isn't the child I put on the airplane four months ago. Wow, um, it's amazing. mind boggling. And what are the ages, what grades basically? What grades do you have? So 10 right through to 12. Wow. So they're young. They are. But that's so cool. <laughs> yeah. It's like a very, very cool. It program. is. And they all live together. They they live, the 10th and, and the 11th and the 12th graders will all be in a dorm together. Um, but my job uh, gets tricky when I have to do the rooming. That's down to me. I, I you know, we're, we're leading up now to hopefully the spring semester and every interview is picked over with a fine tooth comb. I want to know as much as I can about each kid so that I can room them safely with roommates that I think they'll get on with. Um, you know, it, it, it's about building that community and therefore we don't just accept everybody that comes. We sort of put everybody into a weight pool and then we see how we can make a community work. Wow. So it's a very serious job. Not just fill in a form and yes, you're coming to Alexander Mass. So do they and and do we have the option to do a full year or is it like one semester? How does it's it one semester. Mm -hmm. uh, we did have a lot of requests to continue to do a second semester because there's nothing to go home for. But because in a full semester you learn the whole program the whole yeah. of Jewish studies and Israel yeah. history. It, it's not possible to do no, a second really, final yeah. one semester. Yeah. yeah. But maybe we're we're looking at uh, branching out. I mean, this year we branched out with a gap semester for uh, pre-university students. Mm -hmm. um, that's something we've never done before. Mm -hmm. So we're definitely looking at, at, at uh, other options. Uh, you know, it, it kind of depends what happens with Corona at the moment. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. And first of all, call Kavod that you. You guys were able to, um, to to continue the program, you know, under the under the, the circumstances, and and it was right. like insane year, but um, that's... it was crazy, crazy. We didn't know Ninoska until yeah. three or four days before they came whether we were going to manage it, whether we'd even get entry permits for them. Oh. Uh, we were hanging by a thread. We had everything in place. And in fact, we are the only semester abroad program. There are three in, in Israel and um, the high schools were the only ones that functioned. Wow. Um, and as of now, we're the only uh, institution that brought in foreign students that has got away with a whole semester with, without any corona. Wow. Not one cool. corona student. So, I I, uh, I feel very proud. We wow. worked very, very hard. I worked extremely hard putting together a protocol. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't have worked had we not had teamwork. Mm -hmm. um, an amazing student. It, it's down to them. They yeah. wanted to make it really succeed for themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, feel, I feel a little bit um, cruel that we had to send them home. Yeah. But uh, yeah. all but good things know, have to come to an end, and that's what we yeah, kept telling them. Exactly, and and I'm sure that they've gained so much from this time, and and they're going to look back on it. And yeah, they're over there now, and like basically house arrest. But <laughs> they're probably going to be able to look back on their semester that they had with you and appreciate it so much more because yes. they're not just leaving it and rolling back into like, oh, carefree life. The, the, it's, probably it's gonna, right. they'll hold on to it a little bit longer and it'll resonate with them a little bit more. Wow. Yeah. Well, that I is very so. impressive. And it sounds like an amazing organization and so cool if you're a teenager to be able to come and do it. So 
Keep up, keep up. I the wish I'd done it. I wish there'd been something like that for me. I know. I'm <laughs> thinking the same thing. Wow. It's really, really very, very cool. But um, I also wanted to say that uh, Polly is an amazing performer. And I had the privilege of performing with you on numerous occasions. And because of all your fantastic endeavor for, for your school there and for, you know, your bringing children into the world in your midwifery career, we, we were never able to consistently have you with us every year or for every show or production. But, you know, you, you've gotten into most of them. You've probably like done like almost like every other oh, one. Yeah. yeah, it seems like you've... I think so been in like every other one and you're a talented singer actor mm-hmm. performer and just all around great uh great showman showwoman or whatever the word would be i don't know but anyway i wanted to just ask, i loved it oh, i loved it yeah i wanted to ask you um well hopefully we'll, we will go back to the theater in the near future and um you know, now that you have like acclimated and to your, your new position, perhaps we might be able to steal you back again for something and put you back on stage where you, you know, do your thing for all of us. I'd love to. I'd love to. As long as there's no singing because there's, that's gone. My singing voice is gone, but I still dream of coming back to act. Yeah. Um, I love it. it. It's a huge passion. Um, and now that Arie, my eldest, is studying uh, yeah. stage design for theatre, cinema and TV at Tel Aviv University, he's doing a, um, a bachelor's and master's degree together. Oh, wow. You know, the passion is just like around us all the time. So absolutely, yeah. I, I love to come back to act. I, I miss it. Very nice. It's, you know, it's important to have that other side to be able to be creative yeah. and uh, let go. And, and women in theatre, for me, I, I, I can only speak for me, but I know for a lot of young women and women of my age, it has been such an opportunity to be to step out on that stage and perform and be me. Mm-hmm. And also to not be me, to be yeah. to be somebody else, yeah. and and to do that with a license, mm-hmm. um, and it's wonderful. Mm-hmm. And I've learned a lot, a lot about um, not just acting skills, but also just working in a team, a different mm-hmm. type of team, working under stress. Yeah, <laughs> um, you know, a lot of that. But putting that that you can do it. You can have your day job. You can have yeah. your after hours job of being a partner, a, a mother, yeah. um, a best friend. And you can also have this for yourself. It's yeah. it's invaluable. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can't thank I can't thank wit enough. I really can't. It's done a lot for me. It's amazing for us to be able to have this outlet for those of us who who want to perform, who want to sing. Um, it's our it's our talent, it's our craft. Yeah. And to be able to have a platform for that craft or to be able to continue to pursue it. And something that I would always say time and time again to anyone when I t- talk about the theater and our doing theater is, um, you know, when we're there, we're performing, we're, we're women, you know, career women and mothers. And as you said, we have like so many different jobs, uh, you know, the job outside the house, the job inside the house. And yet we're able to carve out that time yeah. for ourselves in the evening for something like this that's important, that, that shows a creative side of us. And I think that's so important because it's important for us to show our children that yes. you know it's okay for us to pursue our dreams and our passions too, you know, to continue to pursue them, to continue to find something that that brings us such joy, you know? Mm. And and also for the young women, one of the other things that I say is that it's important for the young women who are participating in our programs, our shows, to be able to see that we are still pursuing our dreams mm. also. And to, to when we stand there in front of them, we're their role models, you know, what better role yes. models can they be? You know, we're, we're moms, we're, you know, nurses, doctors, lawyers, 
you know, homemakers, everything. And yeah. we're saying, you know, yes, you could do that and you can do this. You can, you can have it all. Yeah. So, to yes. so it's also, Absolutely. it's actually very important, but we will absolutely get you back. Now, I want to ask you a couple questions. Um, first of all, uh, what, what keeps you sane and what keeps you grounded in general? That thing that you just got to do. So first of all, it's cooking. Mm. I, I find being creative about food. And in the last few years, it's been about being creative and healthy about food. Mm -hmm. For me is a, a huge stress reliever. Um, I love nothing more than I, I walk in the door, I peel off my jacket, put my, down my bag, throw the phone on the, on the counter and look at a cookery book. I'll just skim through it. Something takes my fancy. And, and generally I've got most of the ingredients in the house. And if I haven't, I'll use that recipe as a base and I'll cook something up. So for me, that is certainly one of my passions and I find it a great stress reliever. Um, also, I uh, every day without fail, I meditate. So oh. it can be five minutes, it can be twenty minutes. Um, I really am quite religious about making that time. I feel that if I can start the day and or finish the day mm -hmm. with some form of meditation my day is complete. And I think that very much keeps me grounded. It, 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 I, I feel I, uh, there's an expression somebody once used with me was, you know, in the back of our heads, we have a dump bucket. And in that dump bucket goes all our worries and our stresses and things we don't want to deal with and that we procrastinate about, but eventually the bucket gets very full mm -hmm. and you have to empty it. Well, the only way really to empty it is, is, is to be very attentive to yourself. And I think that for me, if I don't find time for me, I'm never going to find time to give and care for everybody else. And I do have a mission to care for as many people as possible. Yeah. So I need that meditation. So it's very much a, a mix between this creativity um, and so this chemistry of putting things into a pot and seeing what will come out of it yeah which is yeah. almost like a very giving thing because somebody else has got to eat it but also a time for me and um, some people call it being selfish finding time no. for me what? it's Why? not i this is exactly i want to put it out there for all you women that <laughs> might be listening to this it is the most unselfish thing you can do is to spend absolutely. time for yourself. Absolutely. It makes you so much of a better person. And that I think absolutely. is what keeps me grounded. And absolutely. my family. Yeah. And spending time with my family, I think is uh, by far the, the thing that makes me most grounded. I am so grateful for my family and to watch the successes of my children um, and, and to have time with all of them with the whole family is just i think uh, those would be my three major grounding things events yes very nice very nice um i love that i love the meditation thing it's very important um the if you could go easy, back easy done yeah if you could go back in time to any point in history and you can meet any one person and spend the day with them. Who would you like to meet? Who, who would you spend that day with? Any person? Oh gosh. The person that springs to mind right now mm -hmm. is, one second. I'm just gonna mute that. Um, so the person that comes to mind is Florence Nightingale. Oh. Nice. Yes. yes. Yeah, she's an amazing really like, woman. She's like the mother of nursing. Yes, absolutely. Wow. Um, she was innovative as well. A she what? brought new ideas in. Yeah. She 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 uh, she was the epitome of of um, 
intelligence mm -hmm. and caring um, of strength. Yeah. Um, and living in a time that was so difficult, you know, in war and, yeah. and poverty. Yeah. Um, I would love to get some tips from her. Wow. You know, I, I, yeah. the, the things that are so obvious to us this day and age about, um, you know, cleanliness and germs and hygiene and, and surgery and how clean before and, and it, it, to think that it wasn't like, you know, we take it for granted. Like, it's like, but of course, you know, you need to clean the instruments and everything around you and all of that yeah. stuff. But she really was, um, she was really a pioneer. I mean, obviously yes. she, she created practically the whole nursing industry as we know it now. Um, right. And she was absolutely amazing. N not to belittle her in any way, shape or form, but you must, must watch. There's a series called Drunk History. Have you ever watched it? Oh, yes, yes, a lot. Love Drunk History. But you've got to see the American version of they did Florence Nightingale. They did her story. Oh. Oh, please promise me you'll go on YouTube. And oh, I will. It, it, I it, watch those with Arie. He loves them. Oh. So we'll watch it together. No, you drunk history is my favorite show. What about? But you can absolutely go and look up the one on Flores right now because it's just historical to watch. I love it so much. But I love that answer. It's so nice. Thank All you. right. Um, okay. And um, now, what do you think? Um, Polly. Well, we're now, you know, like how you have Polly, the Polly, um, basic Polly, then it was Polly, you know, 2.0 and Polly 3.0. And because you've like gone on to like your, you know, right. your career at this point, I feel. But let's talk about Polly 2.0 with regards to Corona. Coming out of this year, hopefully, <laughs> it's just this year and it's not going to be next year <laughs> too much. But coming out of Corona, post Corona world, what um, what have you gained from this experience? I know that we've all had challenges and there are things that have been difficult for us, but is there one thing that you think you, you, you made you better? Something that you, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a, you know, that you found, like, uh, for example, for me, I think that I hope, I feel that I will try to find more time to meet with people and be with people having had that taken away from me right i, I so, find, yeah and i i without a doubt it's going to be maintaining and keeping up with dear friends mm -hmm. and making time to ask everybody how are you yes um I took for granted the, 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 the popping into somebody's house and meeting them in the supermarket and catching up with the news by going to shul or, um, you know, going to the gym, you'd bump into people. And, and then that was all taken away. Yeah. And we became, as I said earlier, we became very insular. We, came, we became about ourselves. We sunk into ourselves. We kept fit for ourselves. We learned to bake bread for our own families. And we became about us. We shut our doors. Yeah. And very quickly, it was frightening actually, how quickly we formed these habits of not seeing people yeah. and not being in touch with them. And I don't ever want to be in this position again. I, I, I uh, even if Corona continues, or if God forbid in our lifetime, there's another incident like this one, I want to know that, that I, Polly, will keep up with my old friends and not be shocked by news because I didn't, I hadn't kept up with them and mm -hmm. things that happened, you know, I don't know, people getting sick and I didn't know about it and I wasn't there with a bowl of soup, with a pot yeah. of soup or whatever. So I think it's very much, it's going to be making a really concerted effort to call people up, you know, on a regular basis, just for a check-in. 
Yeah. Hi, how are you doing? Yeah. I think that that for me is really important. Excellent. Very well. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I'm right there with you. I mean, I, I think that I tried to reach out to people in general, like I would send messages before. Hi, how are you doing? Or I would see people, I would do that. Um, I found that I didn't, because I was so busy with work and everything else, um, that you got busy. Yeah. So for me, like, you know, I would get busy with work and whatever and then I didn't make the time to go and meet a friend for a cup of coffee I made the time to call them and I made the time to send the message and check in with them how you doing how's it going but I never made the time to get together with them in person right and they were right around the corner for me and having had that taken away from me um you know, I, I know people who, who meet with their friends. Maybe I'm not going to be judgmental, but I think some people do it a little too much. And, you know, every day they're meeting with a different friend for a coffee or this or that. But I want to be able to carve out one day a week where I can actually go meet with a friend, you know, right. and, and try to make it happen and yeah. just say, you know, because that, that was taken away. So I felt like, you know, my, my emotional connections are still there, reaching out to people, talking to people. Um, but the physical connection was gone, right. has been taken right. away. And I miss that very much. And so I want to try to entertain a little bit more, which I was also just very selfish about my, my Shabbos is, I would just say, you know, in a good way, um, you know, no, Shabbos was for a family. That's it. Like, I, you know, like I, maybe once a month, once every six weeks, you know, and it was like, no, 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 I needed to be my family. No, I'm just going to try to add maybe one more Shabbos in <laughs> so right. to, to get together with people. So, yeah, I don't want it to be about, oh, we have to go and I have to go meet with my two good friends yeah. uh, for a walk on the beach because tomorrow's the lot down no, you know no, I, no. I, I want to be able to say you're right once a week I'm going to make yeah. time to, yeah. to see somebody and and that they, they are my focus yeah at, you know at that time I also I, I miss it desperately um the social interaction you know is is so important I I can't imagine a life without it yeah um but it frightens me that it's become so easy and convenient to just come home and I'm lucky I am blessed because I go out to work yeah. but for people who are working from home yeah. or aren't working because they're on um, unpaid leave or yeah. they've lost their jobs I cannot imagine how the last what's it been um, nine months you know it practically never leaving practically. the house never having to leave the house yeah it's practically been, it's been about 10 months and for me, I haven't been out of the house since March. I can still count on my two hands the number of time I've gone out to have to go get this or this because I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm in a high risk category. Right. right. And um, I just, I've been home and it is, right. it, yeah, I miss, yeah. I miss people, but uh, I made a point of reaching out to them you know zoom and and uh all sorts of different things but yeah and and it's but it's it's been very challenging and i i do feel for people who have lost their jobs but we've been able to function we've been able to work from home i've been able to work from home my husband's been able to work from home so i'm very very fortunate with everything i just have to be grateful gratitude yes. is like yes. my is my thing you just I'm with you sister I get it completely I really every day I get in the car and I go to work and I have colleagues to talk to yeah. who interestingly we have become so closer to each other yes. through this and and through putting together a program in the time of this crisis we really have become a very formidable strong team wow. but I know that every day I get in the car and I go to work I am blessed yeah that a I have a job and b I leave the house every day mm -hmm. to go to that job yeah. and mm -hmm. the third blessing is is to be meeting new people when the the, the new cohort comes in you know it's yeah. to me that's three blessings what more could a girl ask for wow very nice 
Absolutely, you said it, and I absolutely uh, agree with you. Now, what was the last book? You're very busy, so you probably don't have a lot of time to read, but it doesn't have to be the last book. Tell me what's one of your favorite books. Um, it could be something from childhood that you, one of those like you go to, like you, you read it again and again, or, right. you know, type of things. Um, I have several. Mm -hmm. um, a book that I've read several times. I don't remember who wrote it, but it's called The Far Pavilions. It's a big book. It's about that thick. Um, it's a love story set what in India. Called? What is it called? The, again? Far, the Far Pavilions. The Far Pavilions. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. I probably even still have it. It's one of those books that when I was packing up my books to make Aliyah, mm -hmm. that was a book that had to come with me. You know, it was it was enough of a, a part of me. Um, and it's a book about um, love in uh, the 1800s mm. in India. Colonial India. And it's very magical and very, very descriptive. And the other book that sticks in my mind is a book I read not that long ago called The Spice Box about uh it's it's um two stories happening simultaneously one in armenia mm -hmm. and one in london mm -hmm. and the uh the uh, young woman who's looking for the spice box that belonged to her grandmother learns through the the the, the finding of the spice box she learns about family she didn't know she had in armenia Wow. And it's absolutely beautiful. Again, it's very descriptive. It's very romantic in its storytelling and its scenery. And it's um, the fact it's set somewhere oriental and mysterious. And I love that. You know, I, I love foreign places. So I love to travel. So. Beautiful. So, yeah. so what is, um, first of all, what is your favorite hot drink? hot chocolate oh yummy um what is the um what is the favorite the, your favorite city that you've ever visited my favorite city will always have to be paris wow it's very romantic what is your favorite um uh room in the house my bedroom mm. i nice. love it i love my big bed and i'm just it's my sanctuary. Very nice. Um, what is your favorite flavor of ice cream? Mint chocolate chip. You're so English. So many English people love that. And I thought you were going to say tea, by the way, for your hot drink. But you know. Oh, no. <laughs> um, and what is your favorite uh, kind of weather? Oh, you know that lovely weather we have in about May, yeah. uh, where it's warm enough, you know, you don't need to have on a jacket, mm -hmm. but it's not so hot. You're like, I need to, you know, yes. I'm, I'm done with this. It's hotter than spring, uh -huh. but not quite the so heat hot. of summer. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Mine, I have to say, is fall in New England. Mm, I, I can see why. I just love it. I love it. I love having to wear a few extra layers, um, but not a big bulky coat. I love my scarf, sweaters. I love boots. And um, I love the trees turning colors. I love the smell of fireplace, the burning mm. fires in, in the air, which you'll get a whiff of, you know, because someone's right. got a fire burning somewhere in a fireplace in New England. But, right. um, yeah. That's that's. I think I say May. I actually love all seasons. I love. I love the fact that the year is made up of changes. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, I think it 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 uh, is a bit of my personality. I don't ever want to be standing in the same place for too long. Yeah. So I don't want the summer all year round. I don't want spring all year round. I want. I love the way that the year is punctuated mm -hmm. by different seasons. So I like a bit of all of them. Very nice. You know, even the harsh winter. I as long as I'm warm. I, I, I get that. I love the snow. Um, so, okay, now that leads me to my final question for you. 
where, when this is over and you're able to travel, where, any place in the world, where would you like to go? Oh gosh, my instinctive re- answer to you is to go to my mother. Mm-hmm. Okay, I haven't seen her for a year. She turned 90 on the 8th of December and that's going to be, I, I know that that's going to be my first place. But where would I go anywhere in the world? Um, oh gosh, that's, I want to go everywhere. So. <laughs> Um, I actually think it would be, um, it would actually be to go to Venice. Yeah, that was supposed to be our 25th wedding anniversary, which was in October, Mm -hmm. but uh, got postponed. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. and I've, I've traveled all around Italy. I've never been to Venice. Wow. And I love Italy. So I think that would be the first place I'd want to go and with who would you like to go to Venice with With Mark (laughs) excellent very nice well I wish that once this is over that you are able to take a a flight and a trip a vacation on your way to Venice you're going to go to England first hop in to to your mom and then swing right around a little bit and go on to Venice and enjoy that wonderful vacation with your with your lovely husband and thank uh, you should be a success and I thank you for for talking with us tonight you are just uh such a fun person (laughs) like yes a person just want to go hang out with and uh you're just lovely you make me smile Polly thank you (laughs) oh thank you most people smile um but this is absolutely lovely and thank you so much for like sharing your experience and your journey and everything with us tonight thank you I I feel honored that you've chosen me for this interview and in Oscar uh, I look up to you you have many talents and I, I watch you take a creation of an idea in your head and make it this amazing creation so uh, I take my hat off to you and it's been a lot of fun to answer your questions so thank you it's been great it's been great so so good night if you enjoyed this podcast be sure to hit the subscribe button and if you're not sure what that is ask someone born after the year 1995